Have you checked out God Honest Truth Ministries lately? Especially our website? If you haven't, go to www.godhonesttruth.com and there you can find out all the information you need to know about God Honest Truth Ministries, including links to our latest post and live stream directly on the homepage. You can also find article teachings and video teachings. You can find audio Bibles to download to whatever device you have and listen to at your own leisure when it's convenient for you. You can find historical information to let you know about the history of the church and the faith and how we got to where we are today in the church and the faith. You can find resources to help you in your study of the Hebrew language, not just apps, but also actual classes from real professors at real institutions so that you can further your study in the Hebrew language. There's also quick references for common liturgy and prayers in case you want to look up something that you don't remember quite exactly or if you want to look at it in the Hebrew. It's all right there on GodHonestTruth.com. You can also find our personal notes on various subjects regarding scripture and doctrines. You can, of course, find the weekly Torah portions to include not only the Torah portion, but the Haft Torah portion and the Brit Hadashah portion as well. You can find out more information about us and our ministry, as well as convenient ways to contact us if you ever need to reach us. You can also find links directly to our podcast channels, where you can find us on the most popular podcasting platforms, including iHeartRadio, Spotify, Amazon Music, iTunes, or what have you. You can find all the direct links right there on our website. And similar to that, you can also find the various links to our video platforms on which we host not only the live stream, but also the on-demand videos as well. And if you're ever looking to connect with us on social media, you can also find our social media profile links directly from our website, whether that be Gab, Parlor, Truth, Twitter, Facebook, or what have you, you can find it all directly from our website. You can also find ways to support the ministry and get involved, whether that's a financial donation, prayers, or what have you, you can find all that information right here on the website. And most importantly, you can find links to our live streams and host every Friday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you for joining us for tonight's service. If this is your first time, we'd just like to take a moment to give you a quick overview of what's going to be going on during tonight's service and live stream. The live stream service is set up so that it can minister to those of you out there who may not have a congregation or a fellowship to go to in person. This is designed so that you can actually take part in an actual service without actually having to go out of your house to a location. Maybe there's not a congregation in your area that you can attend. Maybe you're homebound for some reason. This service is meant for those of you like that in that situation. We're gonna start out with a brief introduction and welcome to the stream. After that, we're gonna get into some liturgy to include both the National Anthem of Israel and the Shema. Then we're going to do some announcements and continue with some liturgy. After we do the liturgy, we'll be getting into the Torah portion, the Haftorah portion, and the Brit Hadashah portion. 
For those of you who are unfamiliar with these terms, the Torah portion is a selection out of the first five books of the Bible. That's the Torah. Then there's the Haftor portion, which comes from the prophets or the writings. Then we have the Brit Hadashah portion, which is a select portion to read every week from the section that most people would call the New Testament. Now we do the Tor portion, the Haftor portion, and the Brit Hadashah portion because if nothing else, the Word of God, or the Word of Yahweh, is more important to do than anything else. So we definitely make sure to do that every week that we have service. Then we get into the drosh or the teaching for the night. And this could be on various subjects, and you should be able to see the subject of tonight's drosh down below in the title of this video. We hope that you enjoyed tonight's broadcast, and if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, be sure to contact us at team at godhonesttruth.com. God Honest Truth Ministries is a ministry supported completely by our Father Yahweh and by viewers like you. If you'd like more information about donating to God Honest Truth Ministries, you can find the links through our website at GodHonestTruth.com. There you can find the links for Buy Me A Coffee, Kofi, and Venmo. There are also other ways to donate as well. You can do that through GabPay, PayPal, you can do it through Facebook, various different means. If you have any questions about donating, you can always contact us at team at GodHonestTruth.com. As of November 2022, God Honest Truth Ministries is not a 501c3 organization. Come join us on all the various social media platforms. Come like and follow us on Facebook, on Twitter, on Truth Social, on Parlor, on Gab, wherever you happen to be, we're probably there also. And you can find all the links to our social media profiles on our website at www.godhonesttruth.com.
So while you're waiting for the video and the live stream to start, why don't you go down below and help us out by hitting that like button. Also hit that subscribe button as well as ring the bell so that you're notified every time that we go live or upload an on-demand video. Hit that share button and share tonight's stream around with your friends, family, coworkers, or who have you. And also go down below and leave us a comment. Say hi, Shabbat Shalom, or what have you, because we always love hearing from you. We always love hearing from you, and if you ever need to contact us with any comments, questions, suggestions, or concerns, or what have you, you can always contact us directly through email at team at godhonesttruth.com, or you can contact us through one of our many social media profiles, which you can find the links to on our website, godhonesttruth.com. We sincerely hope that you enjoyed tonight's live stream. The stream will be starting shortly, so just hang on just a short while longer. Well, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Welcome back to another edition of God Honest Truth live stream. We are God Honest Truth, and we are a Messianic ministry based out of Western North Carolina. <clears throat> now, tonight's drosh is going to be a fairly interesting one. It's going to be rather long, so don't let that dissuade you because we always put it up for on demand. But it's going to be about a separate set of laws for Jews and non-Jews. Okay, they're called the Noahide Laws, and we'll be getting into all that when it comes up to Drosh time. So if you've never heard about the Noahide Laws, or if you would like to learn more about the Noahide Laws, definitely stay tuned for tonight's Drosh or tonight's teaching. Now before we get into that, we're of course going to be doing our liturgy, our Torah portion, our Haft Torah portion, and our Brit Hadashah portion. And if you're just joining us for the first time, we'd like to say Shalom and Welcome. 
Like I said, we are God Honest Truth Ministry, and you can find out more about us at www.godhonesttruth.com. You can find resources to help you in your walk, in your education, audio Bibles, resources to help you with your learning of Hebrew, ways to contact us, and so much more. So go check it out at GodHonestTruth.com. And as always, if you need to contact us for any reason, even just to say hi, that'd be great. You can write us through email at team at GodHonestTruth.com. So with all that being said, let's go ahead and dive right into our liturgy. Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad. Baruch Shem Kivod, Malhuto, Leolam Vayed. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be his name, whose glorious kingdom is for eternity. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And have these words which I command you this day be upon your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your children, and speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. And you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and let them be frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and upon your gates. So in the way of announcements this week, we're obviously going to be giving you the list of upcoming episodes for about the next two months or so. Like I said, tonight's Josh is going to be all about the no hide law, so make sure to definitely stay tuned for that or catch up tomorrow morning on the on-demand version to learn all about the no hide laws. Next week, we're going to be doing a Drosh on Shavuot. So if you don't know what Shavuot is or if you'd like to learn more about Shavuot, what it is, where it came from, customs, food, celebrations, all that good stuff, make sure to tune in next week for that Drosh on Shavuot. And make sure to tune in every week on Friday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time for each of the upcoming droshes here. And as always, here is your list of upcoming feast days and Moedim for the next year, all the way up through Pesach of next year. And, of course, our next uh, Moedim is going to be Shavuot. And that starts at sunset on May 25th and runs through sunset of May 27th. And one more time, make sure to tune in next week for a drosh telling you all about Shavuot. And as always, if you have any prayer requests or announcements that you would like to have announced live on air, make sure to have those in to us by Thursday evening at the latest, because we do go live on Friday evenings at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get right back to our liturgy.
Blessed are you, O Lord our God, who has given us the way of salvation in Messiah Yeshua. He walked among us, filled with your Spirit. The only one who ever perfectly fulfilled your Torah. He healed the sick and raised the dead. The multitudes of our people sought his touch. He taught as no man taught. With authority he brought forth the treasures of the Torah. How the children sought him, the lepers he touched and made clean. How the despised and outcast found love and release from their sin. How the hypocrites feared him, whose words uncovered their sin. Despised and rejected, acquainted with grief, he bore the sins of Israel. All we, like sheep, have gone astray, turned every one to his own way. Our iniquities were laid upon the king, the sins of the world, his burden to bear. He rose from the dead and opened the way to life everlasting. Praise his name. We are in him. His spirit empowers. New life is ours with joy and peace. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, who has given us Messiah our King. For the sake of our Master Yeshua and his merit and virtues, may the sayings of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be favorable before you, O Lord, my Rock and my Redeemer. Amen. Avinu Shabbat Shemayim Yikidesh Shimcha Tavo Mehutecha Yasa Retonecha Baaret Kaasher Naasa Vashemayim Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name, let thy kingdom come, let thy will be done, as on earth so as in heaven. Ten Lanu Hayom Lechem Hukenu Usalach Lanu Et Ashmatenu Ka Asher So Lechim Anachnu La Asher Ashmulanu Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Ve al Tevienu Lide Musa Kiim Hatsilenu Min Hara Kilaha Hamamlaha Vahagavura Vahatifaret La Olame Olamim. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. None can compare to you, O Lord, and nothing compares to your creation. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your mercy endures throughout all generations. The Lord is King. The Lord was King. The Lord shall be King throughout all time. May the Lord grant His people mercy. May the Lord bless His people with peace. Proclaim the Lord's greatness with me. Let us exalt Him together. And it came to pass, whenever the ark went forth, Moses would say, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered. May those who hate you flee from before you. For from Zion shall go forth the Torah and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Blessed be he who in holiness gave the Torah to his people Israel. And tonight's Torah portion is going to be Leviticus chapter 9 verse 1 through chapter 11 verse 47. So it's going to be a pretty lengthy one tonight. And if you would like to follow along with us in your preferred translation at home, we'll give you just a moment to find that in your translation that you have. Leviticus chapter 9, verse 1 through chapter 11, verse 47. And on the eighth day it came to be that Moshe called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel, and he said to Aaron, Take for yourself a young bull as a sin offering and a ram as an ascending offering, a perfect one, and bring them before Yahweh. And speak to the children of Israel, saying, 
Take a male goat as a sin offering and a calf and a lamb, both a year old, perfect ones, as an ascending offering, and a bull and a ram as peace offerings to slaughter before Yahweh, and a grain offering mixed with oil. For today Yahweh shall appear to you. And they took what Moshe commanded before the tent of appointment, and all the congregation knew, drew near and stood before Yahweh. And Moshe said, This is the word which Yahweh commanded you to do, so that the esteem of Yahweh appears to you. And Moshe said to Aaron, Go to the slaughtering place and prepare your sin offering and your ascending offering, and make atonement for yourself and for the people, and make the offering of the people, and make atonement for them as Yahweh has commanded. So Aaron came near to the slaughter place and slew the calf of the sin offering, which was for himself. And the sons of Aaron brought the blood to him, and he dipped his finger in the blood and put it on the horns of the slaughter place and poured the blood at the base of the slaughter place. And the fat and the kidneys and the appendage on the liver of the sin offering he burned on the slaughter place as Yahweh had commanded Moshe. And the flesh and the skin he burned with fire outside the camp. And he slew the ascending offering and the sons of Aaron presented to him the blood which he sprinkled on the slaughter place all around. And they presented the ascending offering to him with its pieces and head, and he burned them on the slaughter place, and he washed the entrails and the legs, and burned them with the ascending offering on the slaughter place. And he brought the people's offering, and took the goat which was the sin offering for the people, and slew it and made it a sin offering like the first one. And he brought the ascending offering and made it according to the right ruling. He also brought the grain offering and filled his hand with it and burned it on the slaughter place besides the ascending offering of the morning. And he slew the bull and the ram as a slaughtering of peace offerings, which were for the people. And Aaron's sons presented to him the blood, which he sprinkled on the slaughter place all around, and the fat from the bull and the ram, the fat tail and the covering, and the kidneys, and the appendage on the liver, and they placed the fat on the breast, and he burned the fat on the slaughter place. But the breast and the right thigh Aaron waved as a wave offering before Yahweh, as Moshe had commanded. Aaron then lifted up his hand toward the people and blessed them, and came down from making the sin offering, and the ascending offering, and the peace offerings. And Moshe and Aaron went into the tent of appointment, and came out and blessed the people. And the esteem of Yahweh appeared to all the people. And fire came out from before Yahweh, and consumed the ascending offering and the fat on the slaughter place. And all the people saw, and cried aloud, and fell on their faces. Leviticus chapter 10 And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his fire holder, and put fire in it, and put incense on it, and brought strange fire before Yahweh, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from Yahweh, and consumed them, and they died before Yahweh. Then Moshe said to Aaron, This is what Yahweh spoke, saying, By those who come near me, let me be set apart. And before all the people, let me be esteemed. And Aaron was silent. And Moshe called to Mishael and Elzaphan, the sons of Uziel, the uncle of Aaron, and said to them, Come near, take your brothers from before the set-apart place out of the camp. So they came near and took them by their long shirts out of the camp, as Moshe had said. And Moshe said to Aaron, and to Eleazar, and to Ithamar his sons, Do not unbind your heads, nor tear your garments, lest you die and wrath come upon all the people. But let your brothers, all the house of Israel, bewail the burning which Yahweh has kindled. And do not go out from the door of the tent of appointment, lest you die, for the anointing oil of Yahweh is upon you. And they did according to the word of Moshe, and Yahweh spoke to Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine or strong drink, you nor your sons with you, when you go into the tent of appointment, lest you die, a law forever throughout your generations, so as to make a distinction between the set-apart and the profane, and between the unclean and the clean, and to teach the children of Israel all the laws which Yahweh has spoken to them by the hand of Moshe. 
And Moshe spoke to Aaron and to Eleazar and Ithamar, his sons who were left, Take the grain offering that is left over from the offerings made by fire to Yahweh, and eat it without leaven beside the slaughter place, for it is most set apart. And you shall eat it in a set apart place, because it is yours by law, and your sons by law, of the offerings made by fire to Yahweh, for so I have been commanded. And the breast of the wave offering, and the thigh of the contribution, you eat in a clean place, you and your sons and your daughters with you, for they are yours by law, and your sons by law, which are given from the slaughterings of peace offerings of the children of Israel. The thigh of the contribution and the breast of the wave offering they bring with the offerings of fat made by fire to bring as a wave offering before Yahweh. And it shall be yours and your sons with you by a law forever, as Yahweh has commanded. And Moshe diligently looked for the goat of the sin offering and saw it was burned up. And he was wroth with Eleazar and Ithamar, the sons of Aaron, who were left, saying, why have you not eaten the sin offering in a set-apart place, since it is most set apart, and Elohim has given it to you to bear the crookedness of the congregation, to make atonement for them before Yahweh? See, its blood was not brought inside this set-apart place. You should have eaten it without fail in a set-apart place, as I have commanded. And Aaron said to Moshe, See, today they have brought their sin offering and their ascending offering before Yahweh, and matters like these have come to me. If I had eaten the sin offering today, would it have been right in the eyes of Yahweh? And when Moshe heard that, it was good in his eyes. Leviticus chapter 11 And Yahweh spoke to Moshe and to Aaron, saying to them, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, These are the living creatures which you do eat among all the beasts that are on the earth, Whatever has a split hoof, completely divided, chewing the cud, among the beasts, that you do eat. Only these you do not eat among those that chew the cud or those that have a split hoof. The camel, because it chews the cud, but does not have a split hoof, it is unclean to you. And the rabbit, because it chews the cud, but does not have a split hoof, it is unclean to you. And the hare, because it chews the cud, but does not have a split hoof, it is unclean to you. And the pig, though it has a split hoof, completely divided, yet does not chew the cud, it is unclean to you. Their flesh you do not eat, and their carcasses you do not touch. They are unclean to you. These you do eat of all that are in the waters. Any one that has fins and scales in the waters, in the seas, or in the rivers, that you do eat. But all that have not fins and scales in the seas and in the rivers all that move in the waters, or any living being which is in the waters, they are an abomination to you. They are an abomination to you, of their flesh you do not eat, and their carcasses you abominate. All that have not fins or scales in the waters are an abomination to you. And these you do abominate among the birds that are not eaten. They are an abomination. The eagle, and the vulture, and the black vulture, and the hawk, and the falcon after its kind, every raven after its kind, and the ostrich, and the nighthawk, and the seagull, and the hawk after its kind, and the little owl, and the fisher owl, and the great owl, and the white owl, and the pelican, and the carrion vulture, and the stork, the heron after its kind, and the hoopoe, and the bat. All flying insects that creep on all fours is an abomination to you. Only these you do eat of every flying insect that creeps on all fours, those which have jointed legs above their feet, with which to leap on the earth. These of them you do eat, the arbe locust after its kind, and the solemn locust after its kind, and the hargol locust after its kind, and the hagab locust after its kind. But all other flying insects which have four feet are an abomination to you, and by these you are made unclean. Any one touching the carcass of any of them is unclean until evening, and anyone picking up part of the carcass of any of them has to wash his garments and shall be unclean until evening. Every beast that has a split hoof, not completely divided, or does not chew the cud, is unclean to you. Anyone who touches their carcass is unclean, and whatever goes on its paws among all the creatures that go on all fours, those are unclean to you. 
Anyone who touches their carcass is unclean until evening, and he who picks up their carcass has to wash his garments and shall be unclean until evening. They are unclean to you. And these are unclean to you among the creeping creatures that creep on the earth, the mole and the mouse and the tortoise after its kind, and the gecko and the land crocodile and the sand reptile and the sand lizard and the chameleon. These are unclean to you among all that creep. Anyone who touches them when they are dead becomes unclean until evening. And whatever any of them in its dead state falls upon becomes unclean. Because whether it is any wooden object or garment or skin or sack, any object in which work is done, it is put in water. And it shall be unclean until evening. Then it shall be clean. Any earthen vessel into which any of them falls, whatever is in it becomes unclean and you break it. Any of the food which might be eaten, on which water comes, becomes unclean, and any drink which might be drunk from it becomes unclean. And on whatever any of their carcass falls becomes unclean, an oven or cooking range, it is broken down. They are unclean and are unclean to you. But a fountain or a well, a collection of water is clean, but whatever touches their carcass is unclean. And when any of their carcass falls on any planting seed which is to be sown, it is clean. But when any water is put on the seed and any part of any such carcass falls on it, it is unclean to you. And when any of the beasts which are yours for food dies, he who touches its carcass becomes unclean until evening. And he who eats of its carcass has to wash his garments and shall be unclean until evening. And he who picks up his carcass has to wash his garments and shall be unclean until evening. And every swarming creature, the one that swarms on the earth, is an abomination. It is not eaten. Whatever crawls on its stomach and whatever goes on all fours and whatever has many feet among all swarming creatures, the one swarming on the earth, these you do not eat, for they are an abomination. Do not make yourselves abominable with any swarming creature. The one swarming, and do not make yourselves unclean with them, lest you be defiled by them. For I am Yahweh your Elohim, and you shall set yourselves apart, and you shall be set apart, for I am set apart. And you do not defile yourselves with any swarming creature, the one creeping on the earth. For I am Yahweh, who is bringing you up out of the land of Mitzrayim, to be your Elohim. And you shall be set apart, for I am set apart. This is, the, this is the Torah of the beast and the birds and every living being, the creeping creature in the waters and of every being that makes swarms on the earth, to make a distinction between the unclean and the clean and between the living creature that is eaten and the living creature that is not eaten. Baruch atah Yahweh, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher natan lanu Torah temet, vechaye olam betukenu, Baruch atah Yahweh, noten ha Torah. Amen. This is the Torah which Moses placed before the children of Israel. It is in accord with the Lord's command by the hand of Moses. It is a tree of life to those who take hold of it, and those who support it are praiseworthy. Its ways are ways of pleasantness, and all its paths are peace. Bring us back, Lord, to you, and we shall come. Renew our days as of old. Etz ha'im hi, lama ha'zim kimba, ve'tome he ha me'ushar, de'ra he ha dar he noam, Veho nativo te ha shalom. Hashi venu adonai. Ele ha vena shuva. Hades, Hades amenu. Hades amenu keke. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has chosen faithful prophets to speak words of truth. Amen.
All right, and tonight's Haftor portion is going to be 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 56 through 58. And we'll give you just one moment to find that in your preferred translation at home if you'd like to read along with us. First Kings chapter 8 verses 56 through 58 Blessed be Yahweh who has given rest to his people Israel according to all that he promised there has not failed one word of all his good word which he promised through his servant Moshe Yahweh our Elohim is with us as he was with our fathers he does not leave us nor forsake us to incline our hearts to himself to walk in all his ways, and to guard his commands and his laws and his right rulings, which he commanded our fathers. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us the living word in Messiah Yeshua. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the renewed covenant. Amen. All right, and tonight's Brit Hadashah portion is going to be Mark chapter 7, verses 9 through 23. And one more time, we'll give you just a moment to find that in your preferred translation at home. First Kings chapter 8 verses 56 through 58 Blessed be Yahweh who has given rest to his people Israel according to all that he promised there has not failed one word of all his good word which he promised through his Mark chapter 7 verses 9 through 23 And he said to them well do you set aside the command of Elohim in order to guard your tradition. For Moshe said, Respect your father and your mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, If a man says to his father or mother, Whatever profit you might have received from me is Corban, that is, a gift, you no longer let him do any matter at all for his father or his mother, nullifying the word of Elohim through your tradition which you have handed down, and many such traditions you do. And calling the crowd to him, he said to them, Hear me, every one, and understand. There is no matter that enters a man from outside which is able to defile him, but it is what comes out of him that defiles the man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he went from the crowd into a house, his taught ones asked him concerning the parable. And he said to them, Are you also without understanding? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside is unable to defile him, because it does not enter his heart but his stomach, and is eliminated, thus purging all the foods? And he said, What comes out of a man, that defiles a man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil reasonings, adulterings, whorings, murders, thefts, greedy desires, wickednesses, deceit, indecency, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these wicked matters come from within and defile a man. Baruch atah Yahweh, Eloheinu melech haolam. Asher natan lanu hadavar haimet, vechaye olam betukenu. Baruch atah Yahweh, noten habrit chadashah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who gave to us the word of truth and planted life everlasting in our midst. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the renewed covenant. Amen.
So in just a moment, we'll be doing tonight's drage, but like always, we're gonna take just a short break. And while we do that, <clears throat> if you've never heard of the Noahide laws before, it'd be interesting to see how many of you out there it'll be a first time for. So go ahead down in the comments below and just let us know that you've never heard about it and that you're interested in learning more about what this Noahide laws is. Um, if you have heard about it before, if you know something about it, also let us know down in the comments below what is the number one thing that sticks out in your mind about the Noahide laws. And so while you're doing that, we're gonna check on our multiple streams right now to YouTube, Odyssey, and Twitch. So if something happens for whatever reason and you can't get the live stream on one platform, you can simply go to another platform and pick it up there so that you'll never be able to miss it. And of course, like always, the best way to catch the live stream is on our website, GodHonestTruth.com. There you can click on the live stream button, or you can also just click on the post for tonight's drosh or for tonight's live stream. And it'll not only have the live stream video, but it also have the drosh notes and the drosh slides right down below it that you can view at your own leisure. So while you're down there leaving those comments, also be sure to hit that like button and hit the subscribe button and ring the bell so that you're notified every time that we go live or when we upload a new on-demand video. And also hit that share button and share it around with your friends, family, colleagues, or who have you. Because chances are, if you're enjoying this kind of stuff, someone in your circle is going to enjoy this also. And it really, really does help us when you spread the word about God Honest Truth Ministries, and we always really, really appreciate it. So just a minute and we'll be getting into tonight's drosh. Definitely going to be a longer drosh tonight. So make sure that you have your paper and pen for your notes ready. And aside from taking your own notes, we have provided the notes that we have taken for the Noahide laws on the website. You can find those through the main website or through the post for tonight's drosh as well. Oh, come on, cooperate. There we go. All right. So like I said, this teaching is going to be all about the Noahide laws. We're going to be getting into what the Noahide laws are. Um, scripture, definitely, because everything we do and believe should be based on Scripture itself. We'll be getting into a little bit of history and also some miscellaneous things regarding this subject of the Noahide Laws. Now, like I just said on the live stream, if you are watching this later on, or if you're watching it right now, whether you're watching it on video or listening to it on audio podcast, you can go to GodHonestTruth.com, click on the post for Noahide Laws, and you'll be able to see not only the drosh slides that are presented during this teaching, but also the notes that we took on this subject of the Noahide Laws as well. So go check that out. And again, regardless of whether you're watching on video or whether you are listening through the audio podcast, if you go down below in the description and the link directly to the post on our website is right there, so it makes it real easy. Now, one thing we'd like to remember, we would like for you to remember before we start is what scripture tells us about things that we hear, right? Whether it's from us or whether it's from your preacher, rabbi, priest, reverend, whether you hear it on TV or whether you get off the internet, whatever it is. Scripture in 1 Thessalonians 5.21 tells us to test everything and hold fast to that what is good. So whatever it is, test it out, question it, see if it lines up to scripture or not. And then if it does, it is good and hold on to that. So to start out tonight's drosh, let's get into what is the Noahide laws anyways. 
I mean, what is this whole thing? Some of you may be coming to this for the first time, or some of you may know very little about it. So let's go ahead and define what it is. Now, first of all, the Noahide laws are called by different things. They're called, obviously, the Noahide laws, the Noahide laws, different spelling. They're called the seven laws of Noah, the Noahian laws, the Noahide code, and maybe a few other things. But generally, they're referred to as the Noahide laws. Now, from the Jewish Encyclopedia, they state this. Laws which were supposed by the rabbis to have been binding upon mankind at large, even before the revelation at Sinai, and which are still binding upon non-Jews. The term Noahian indicates the universality of these ordinances, since the whole human race was supposed to be descended from the three sons of Noah, who alone survived the flood. Basing their views on the passage in Genesis 2.16, they declared that the following six commandments were enjoined upon Adam, not to worship idols, not to blaspheme the name of God, to establish courts of justice, not to kill, not to commit adultery, and not to rob. So starting to get a picture, the Universal Jewish Encyclopedia says pretty much the same thing. They state, According to the rabbinic interpretation of certain passages in Genesis, Adam, Noah, and his descendants, the whole human race, were commanded by God to observe the following seven commandments by refraining from idolatry, adultery and incest, bloodshed, blasphemy, robbery, social injustice, eating flesh cut from a living animal. The Talmud refers to 30 laws which non-Jews are supposed to observe and to which they will faithfully adhere in the Messianic period. Menahem Azari Afano enumerates these 30 laws as details of the seven basic commandments. So basically we've got the different seven laws, right? And so far we've seen that it's according to rabbinic interpretation. And where do we get that rabbinic interpretation? Right from the Talmud, from Sanhedrin 56a. The sages taught in a Beraita that the descendants of Noah, i.e. all of humanity, were commanded to observe seven mitzvot, the mitzvah of establishing courts of judgment and the prohibition against blessing, i.e. cursing the name of God, and the prohibition of idol worship and the prohibition against forbidden sexual relations and the prohibition of bloodshed and the prohibition of robbery and the prohibition against eating a limb from a living animal. So more or less that's directly from the horse's mouth. Now, later on in the 12th century, there was a guy named Maimonides who kind of expounded on this and gave his take on it. And he writes in Mishneh Torah, six precepts were commanded to Adam, the prohibition against worship of false gods, the prohibition against cursing God, the prohibition against murder, the prohibition against incest and adultery, the prohibition against theft, the command to establish laws and courts of justice, the prohibition against eating flesh from a living animal was added for Noah as Genesis 9, 4 states, Nevertheless, you may not eat flesh with its life, which is its blood. Thus, there are seven mitzvot. And that's from Maimonides in Mishneh Torah, about the 12th century or so. So what this basically boils down to is a set of seven, not 613, seven different laws. Like I said, a summary of those are as, one, do not worship idols or engage in idolatry. Two, do not blaspheme the name of Yahweh or commit blasphemy. Three, do not murder. Four, do not steal or rob. Five, do not commit fornication or adultery. Six, do not eat the flesh of a living animal. Seven, establish courts of justice. Now, if you haven't caught on as of yet, okay, in the first descriptions we gave, the... Noahide laws are for non-Jews, okay? That's what the Noahide laws are meant for. All of humanity, except for the Jews, okay? So what this kind of creates is like a two-path system, okay? According to the Universal Jewish Encyclopedia, quote, unlike Christianity, Judaism does not deny salvation to those outside of its fold, for, according to Jewish law, 
all non-Jews who observe the Noahide laws will participate in salvation and in the rewards of the world to come. And this is quoting from Sanhedrin 105a, a part of the Talmud. So what does Sanhedrin 105a state? Quote, From the fact that it is written, all the Gentiles, it is apparent that none of the Gentiles have a share in the world to come. It is stated only, all the Gentiles that forget God. Rather, the wicked shall be turned back to the netherworld. And who are they? They are all the Gentiles that forget God. Gentiles who fear God do have a share in the world to come. So now we've looked at the Talmud and where the where we get the Noahide laws from. And we've also look in, looked at how non-Jews, according to rabbinic Judaism, Judaism interpret it, how non-Jews can have a place in what they call the world to come, what we would, we would call the kingdom of Yahweh. And what this leads to is a two-road system, okay, to salvation or to the kingdom. There's one law for the Jews and then one law for the non-Jews, who they would refer to as Gentiles, Goyim, or the nations. Okay, so this is all well and good, right? But so far, everything we've looked at is either from the Talmud or a medieval rabbi's interpretation and writings on it. So what about scripture where we base all of our faith and doctrines on? Where do we find this whole concept of Noahide laws in scripture? Well, when we look in scripture, we find the Noahide laws contained in, yeah, nowhere. Noahide laws are nowhere in scripture. You can look high and you can look low from Genesis to Revelation and you will not find the Noahide laws, not even once referenced even. So not only are they not spelled out, they're not referred to or even referenced. Okay. But you may say what we read earlier, it references certain scriptures, right? Let's look at that from the Jewish encyclopedia, basing their views on the passage in Genesis 2 16. They declared that the following six commandments, commandments were enjoyed upon Adam, not to worship idols, not to blaspheme the name of God, to establish courts of justice, not to kill, not to commit adultery, and not to rob. Notice what they said right there, that they were basing their views and getting these seven Noahide laws, or rather it would be six at this point because it's just Adam, right? They were getting these six Noahide laws from the passage in Genesis 2.16. So let's look at that, and let's look at the verses surrounding that just for further context. Genesis 2, verses 15 through 18. And Elohim took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to guard it. And Yahweh Elohim commanded the man, saying, Eat of every tree of the garden, but do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall certainly die. And Yahweh Elohim said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I am going to make a helper for him as his counterpart. I'm going to leave this up there just for a moment. Look back at it real quick and see if you can identify the six or even seven, maybe the six Noahide laws here in this passage. Do you see them anywhere? Because I don't, right? <clears throat> now remember, those six Noahide laws that were supposedly given to Adam were not to worship idols, not to blaspheme, establish courts of justice, not to kill, not to commit adultery, not to rob. Do you see any of that here in Genesis 2.16 or even 15 through 18? Nothing like that. Kind of interesting, right? But moving on, what about the seventh one? Maimonides writes that the prohibition against eating flesh from a living animal was added for Noah as Genesis 9-4 states, Nevertheless, you may not eat flesh with its life, which is its blood. 
Thus, there are seven mitzvot. So what they're claiming is that originally there were six of these Noahide laws given to Adam. And then when Noah came along and then they got off the ark at the end there, there was a seventh given to them. And this happens, they say, in Genesis 9, 4. What was that seventh one? Eating the flesh from a living animal. Okay, well, let's look at Genesis 9, 4. We're going to read Genesis 9, 3 through 4. Every creeping creature that lives is food for you. I have given you all as I have given, as I gave the green plants. But do not eat flesh with its life, its blood. Okay, supposedly, this is where the commandment for do not eat the flesh of a living animal comes from. Okay? So maybe right here you can kind of make it, but no, not really. What this passage is saying is do not eat blood. Okay? I don't know where the flesh of a living animal came from because it's not referencing anything that's living. It's referencing food from a dead animal that, you know, still has blood in it. It says, don't eat that. I mean, was zombieism an issue when they came up with this? I'm not really sure. I mean, it's still not a thing today. Back in 2012, there was a news report saying there was a zombie attack in down in Florida because one man ate the face off of another man, but he was hopped up on bath salts. So... You know, Noahide laws, Torah, laws of the land, it doesn't really matter at that point, right? And I've never seen and never heard of anyone walking up to a grazing cow and start gnawing off a steak, right? That's just not happened. So why is there this prohibition about eating from a living animal? I just, it's odd. I don't really get that. And it doesn't come from the verse that they say it comes from in Genesis 9, 4. So we don't find it when we look through scripture. We don't find the Noahide laws. And even when we look at the verses they give us for the source, it doesn't come from there either. So far, what we've seen is the source for these Noahide laws come from the Talmud, not scripture. So what all this implies and what we're starting to see here is that all of this is a exercise in eisegesis. Now, dictionary.com defines eisegesis as an interpretation, especially of scripture that in expresses the interpreter's own ideas, bias, or the like, rather than the meaning of the text. In other words, you're reading into the Bible your opinion, what you want it to say. Okay? And so far, that's what we've seen there. Now, this whole Noahide thing, like I said, comes down to a matter of eisegesis, and it creates a two roads to salvation issue, right? Clearly saw that already, which goes against Scripture. Okay, we're going to look more about that in just a minute. But also, this whole idea is predicated on the notion that the Torah was only given to the Jews, okay? Israel, but what modern-day Judaism would call the Jews. However, when the Torah was given, there was more than just the Jews there. In Exodus 12, 37 through 38, it clearly lets us know that when they left Egypt, there was more than just the Jews. Quote, And the children of Israel set out from Ramses to Sukkot, about 600,000 men on foot, besides the little ones. And a mixed multitude went up with them too, also flocks and herds, very much livestock. End quote. So what we see here when they're leaving Egypt, that Israel, the people of Israel, Jacob's descendants, right? They were leaving, obviously, but with them were non-native Israelites. There was a mixed multitude going with them. And they all, Israelites and non-Israelites, as one company, all went through the wilderness to Sinai. And then they got to Sinai, and Moshe went up on the mountain and brought the commandments down 
and you know gave the Torah to all the people there at the bottom. And after they heard this, what did they say? Exodus 24, 3. And Moshe came and related to the people all the words of Yahweh and all the right rulings, and all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which Yahweh has spoken, we shall do. So everyone there, the Israelites and the non-Israelites, said that we will obey and do what Yahweh has spoken. So the Torah was not given to just the tribe of Judah, the Jews. It was given to all 12 tribes of Israel and everyone else there in the mixed multitude. It's not just for Israel. It's not just for the Jews. It's for everyone. Okay? And when we go around and we make up new stuff to kind of separate people and create divisions, you know, that's going against Scripture. That's adding to Scripture. And we know what Scripture says about adding to the Word. Deuteronomy 4.2 Do not add to the Word which I command you, and do not take away from it, so as to guard the commands of Yahweh your Elohim, which I am commanding you. And again, Proverbs 35-6 through Every word of Eloah is tried. He is a shield to those taking refuge in him. Do not add to his words, lest he reprove you and you be found a liar, etc., etc., etc. I mean, this drosh is already going to be fairly long, so we didn't include all the verses that say do not add, okay? You can go look for those in your own study because there's more than just these two that we presented. But again, the point is we do not add or change the word of Yahweh. We do not add to or change the Torah, okay? But it happens. We see that happening in Judaism, especially rabbinic Orthodox Judaism. We see that happening within mainstream churchianity. If you do any kind of study on church history, you see that all over the place. Okay? And this is nothing new, right? Ecclesiastes 1.9 tells us that what has been is what shall be. What has been done is what shall be done, and there is no new matter under the sun. Okay? So we look back at the start of the Noahide laws in the Talmud about the 3rd century or something like that. Even that wasn't new. Okay? We look at 2 Kings 17, 19 to 20. Yehuda also did not guard the commands of Yahweh their Elohim, but walked in the laws of Yisrael, which they made. And Yahweh rejected all the seed of Yisrael and afflicted them and gave them into the hand of plunderers until he had cast them out from his presence. So this is something that happened way back in the day, like not long after King Solomon. So when it happened again where they added to Scripture in the 3rd century with the Talmud, like Scripture says, there's nothing new under the sun. What has been, shall be. And then we see it all through mainstream churchianity's history as well. There's nothing new under the sun. What has been, shall be. And we'll probably continue seeing it on and on. Isaiah 29, 13. And Yahweh says, Because this people has drawn near with its mouth, and with its lips they have esteemed me, and it has kept its heart far from me, and their fear of me has become a command of men that is taught. So these people were saying, hey, I follow after Yahweh. I do all this stuff, right? But their heart wasn't in it, and what they were actually meaning and actually doing wasn't the right thing to do. Sort of like the Noahide laws. And again, it's not something new, because Yeshua was dealing with very similar things Back in his day, and he quotes Isaiah here, Matthew 15, 3 and 7 through 9. But he answering said to them, Why do you also transgress the command of Elohim because of your tradition? Hypocrites, yes, Yeshua rightly prophesied about you, saying, This people draw near to me with their mouth and respect me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching as teachings the commands of men. Now, Remember, Yeshua here was coming against the Pharisees of his day, the educated, 
educated leaders of the temple and Judaism, right? Now, these Pharisees at that time eventually came down to us what we know today of as rabbinic Judaism, Orthodox Judaism. Okay? So, the Orthodox rabbis that we deal with today are pretty much the same kind of thing that Yeshua was dealing with back in his day as well. And now, we are also dealing with this creation of the Noahide laws that they came up with in the 3rd century. But like we saw earlier, this Noahide laws concept creates a... Uh, well, what's the word I'm looking for? It creates a situation in which there are two ways to salvation and to the kingdom, or what they call the world to come. There are two different commands, sets of laws, sets of Torah, for A, Jews, and B, non-Jews. But what does Scripture have to say about something like that? Exodus 12, 49-50. There is one Torah for the native-born and for the stranger who sojourns among you. And all the children of Israel did as Yahweh commanded Moshe and Aaron, so they did. Again, in Numbers 15, 14 through 16. And when a stranger sojourns with you, or whoever is among you throughout your generations, and would make an offering made by fire, a sweet fragrance to Yahweh, as you do, so he does. One law is for you of the assembly and for the stranger who sojourns with you. A law forever throughout your generations, as you are, so is the stranger before Yahweh. One Torah and one right ruling is for you and for the stranger who sojourns with you. Okay, so even in the Torah, in the Tanakh, we see that there is only one Torah, one set of commands, one set of laws, not two. Okay, so this concept of the Noahide laws contradicts Scripture. There's not two set of laws. There's one set of laws for both those in the congregation of Israel and also everyone else. And we see this go on into the Brit Hadashah as well. 1 John 3, 4, the definition of sin. Quote, everyone doing sin also does lawlessness and sin is lawlessness. End quote. So we see here that sin is breaking of the Torah. Okay, who is it that's breaking Torah? It does not specify because it's everyone. Anyone and everyone who sins is doing so because they're breaking Torah. You don't have to be a Jew. You don't have to be of Israel. It's anyone because there's only one Torah, one right ruling, one set of laws for everyone. This goes on again in 1 John 5, 2 through 3. Quote, By this we know that we love the children of Elohim when we love Elohim and guard his commands. For this is the love for Elohim that we guard his commands and his commands are not heavy. End quote. So again, it does not specify one specific group or another specific group. This is for everyone. Okay? Remember when we read back in the beginning how that the Sanhedrin portion that we read referred to the Gentiles who feared God and loved God would be those who kept the Noahide laws? No. Scripture here says that those who love Elohim are those who keep his commands, right? Those who keep his Torah, what he instructed us to do. And that's everyone, not one specific group, not another specific group, but everyone. One Torah, as Scripture says, for everyone. And in contradiction to this notion of the Noahide laws that states, or that gives off the impression that there's two different ways to salvation, there's two different ways to the kingdom, Scripture says otherwise. Acts 4, 9-12. 
If today we are called to account for a good deed towards a sick man by whom he has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that in the name of Yeshua Messiah of Nazareth, whom you impaled, whom Elohim raised from the dead, by him this one stands before you healthy. This is the stone which was, re which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone, and there is no deliverance in anyone else, for there is no other name under the heaven given among men by which we need to be saved." End quote. So, the only way to salvation is not through the Noahide laws, is not through Torah even, it's through Yeshua. Now we do Torah because it's good for us and because we love Yahweh. But our salvation comes through Yeshua, that perfect sacrifice, our high priest in the heavens. And that's the only way to salvation. Just a quick check here. All right, so we're going to take uh, just a real short break, like five minutes. And uh, after that, we'll be coming right back and we're going to finish up with this. We're going into the history of the Noahide laws and also getting into some miscellaneous things surrounding that as well. You definitely want to stick around for the miscellaneous things because that is also important. See you in about five minutes.
All right, and we are back. <clears throat> so just to recap real quick, we have covered what the Noahide laws are, those seven Noahide laws. Uh, we've covered where it came from, and we've covered the scriptural take on the Noahide laws and the mindset surrounding that. So now let's go ahead and dive into the history or a little bit of a history of the Noahide laws. Now, some people claim that you can find evidence for the Noahide laws even back as far as the Book of Jubilees. Now, obviously, those who are proponents of the Noahide laws will say it goes all the way back to Adam, right? But as far as, you know, written history goes, we can't find it in Scripture, but they do say that you can find evidence for it in the Book of Jubilees. Let's look at that real quick. Book of Jubilees, chapter 7, verses 23 through 25. And in the 28th Jubilee, Noah began to enjoin upon his son, sons, the ordinances and commandments and all the judgments that he knew. And he exhorted his sons to observe righteousness and to cover the shame of their flesh and to bless their creator and honor father and mother and love their neighbor and guard their souls from fornication and uncleanness and all iniquity. For owing to these three things came the flood upon the earth, namely, end quote. So, <clears throat> is this evidence for the Noahide laws? I mean, I'm not really saying there's a few there, but, you know, basically the best thing you got going as far as that goes is Noah was telling his sons all the commandments and the ordinances, right? But if we take a closer look at it and compare what's listed here in the Book of Jubilees, to what is the Noahide laws, we see there is a difference. Number one, the book of Jubilees here only states six different things, whereas the Noahide laws has seven. And of course, by this time in Noah's life, he would have been doing seven, not the six of Adam. Namely, if you look here in the book of Jubilees, there are two that are not covered in the Noahide laws. And that is honor your father and mother and love their, their neighbor. And in comparison, the Noahide laws contains do not eat the flesh of a living animal. That's not found in the book of Jubilees that we just read. And it also has established courts of justice, which we do not found, find in that passage from the book of Jubilees. So, no, this is not evidence for the Noahide laws, not unless you're engaging in eisegesis again. Now, I'm not saying the book of Jubilees is, you know, divinely inspired scripture because we don't have that in most of our canon of scripture. There are certain denominations within Christianity that do, but, you know, most of us, we do not. Now, if we look, so let me back up here. I was trying to think of which ones actually did, but I've forgotten. It's probably in my notes, but anyways. So the Book of Jubilees was about 200 years almost before the time of Yeshua and the apostles. However, there's still the claim that the Noahide laws were even existent at the time of the apostles as well. And they make the claim that in the Book of Acts, chapter 15, that you find evidence for the Noahide laws also. Look at that real quick. Acts 15, 19 through 21. Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those from among the nations who are turning to Elohim, but that we write to them to abstain from the defilement of idols and from whoring and from what is strangled and from blood. For from ancient generations, Moshe has in every city those proclaiming him being read in the congregations every Sabbath. So you see four different things right here. Namely, okay, that is abstain from the defilement of idols, no idolatry, right? Abstain from whoring, abstain from what is strangled and from blood. Those four different things. But the important thing here that you should notice is that the, uh, from ancient generations, Moshe has in every city those proclaiming him 
being read in the congregations every Sabbath. So what is that referring to? That's referring to the Torah. They're saying that when new people come to the faith, that not to heap everything on top of them all at once, because it's going to be overwhelming, right? It can be very discouraging. It could even cause people to backslide and go out of the faith. So they say that when people come to the faith, that they are to immediately stop doing four things. That's from idolatry, from whoring, from eating things that are strangled, and eating blood. Okay, just those four things. And then they go to synagogue, they go to their church, their fellowship, where they're going to learn more of the Torah because it's read every Sabbath. Okay? One Torah for everyone. That's what they're getting at right here. They're not saying there's seven laws that only non-Jews have to follow. No, they're saying these four things start out with that and then learn as you go. And that's what they write to the churches when they send out their letter in Acts 15, 28 through 29. For it seemed good to the set apart spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessities that you abstain from what is offered to idols and blood and what is strangled and whoring. If you keep yourselves from these, you shall do well, be strong. So again, if we compare Acts 15 side by side with the Noahide laws, we find there is differences, right? Acts 15, abstain from the defilement of idols, okay? You can get that from the Noahide laws about idolatry. Abstain from whoring. You can get that from the Noahide laws about fornication and adultery, okay? No strange thing there. Abstain from what is strangled, Mm, that doesn't really fit in. Maybe with eating the flesh of a living animal, but it's not the same thing. What is strangled is dead. And the Noahide laws refers to the flesh of a living animal. Abstain from blood. Again, maybe you get that from the Noahide law about eating the flesh of a living animal. But no, not really. As we saw in Genesis 9-4 about Noah, he was told not to eat the blood. Okay, wasn't referring to eating a living animal. It was referring to eating blood from a dead animal. Because, again, who in history has ever walked up to an animal and just started gnawing on it to eat it? Okay, maybe it's happened. There's lots of weird things in the world. Uh, if you have an instance of that happening, please send it to me. I'd like to, you know, look at it. But notice the things from the Noahide laws that are not contained in Acts 15. That's about blaspheming. Yeah, I mean, we shouldn't blaspheme, but it's not included in Acts 15. Do not murder. Yeah, we shouldn't murder, but it's not included in Acts 15. Do not steal rob. Again, not included in Acts 15. Establish courts of justice. That's in the Noahide laws, but it's not in Acts 15. So no, Acts 15 is not evidence for the Noahide laws. Noahide laws did not come around until almost 200 years after the apostles coming from the Talmud. And I quote from Sanhedrin 56a again. The sages taught in a berita, the descendants of Noah, i.e. all of humanity, were commanded to observe seven mitzvot, the mitzvah of establishing courts of judgment and the prohibition against blessing, i.e. cursing the name of God and the prohibition of idol worship and the prohibition against forbidden sexual relations and the prohibition of bloodshed and the prohibition of robbery and the prohibition against eating a limb from a living animal. Okay. This was about 200, about third century. Okay. Long after the apostles. This is the first evidence we have of Noahide laws. Well after Adam, well after Noah, well after Yeshua walked the earth, well after the apostles. Okay? Noahide laws did not come in until about the third century CE. And then like we said, Later on in the 12th century, Maimonides in the Mishneh Torah expands on this and gives his commentary as well. 
And we've already read some, but here is a whole lot more about what Maimonides said regarding the Noahide laws. Quote, a treaty cannot be made with a city which, des which desires to accept a peaceful settlement until they deny idol worship, destroy their places of worship, and accept the seven universal laws commanded Noah's descendants. For every Gentile who does not accept these commandments must be executed if he is under our undisputed authority. By the same regard, Moses was commanded by the Almighty to compel all the inhabitants of the world to accept the commandments given to Noah's descendants. If one does not accept these commands, he should be executed. A person who formally accepts these commands is called a resident alien. End quote. So, look at what's being said here. It says, By the same regard, Moses was commanded by the Almighty to compel all in the inhabitants of the world to accept the commandments given to Noah's descendants. Where do you find that in Scripture? You don't. Because it's not there. Moses was not commanded to impose on non-Israelites the Noahide laws because Noahide laws were not invented until the 3rd century CE. Going on, Maimonides writes, Anyone who accepts upon himself the fulfillment of these seven mitzvot and is precise in their observance is considered one of the pious among the Gentiles and will merit a share in the world to come. This applies only when he accepts them and fulfills them because the Holy One, blessed be he, commanded them in the Torah and informed us through Moses, our teacher, that Noah's descendants had been commanded to fulfill them previously. However, if he fulfills them out of intellectual conviction, he is not a residential alien, nor of the pious among the Gentiles, nor of their wise men. Again, he's talking about how it was given to Moses and Moses commanded everyone, but... It didn't happen because it's not in Scripture. Where in the Torah that's not do you find Moses being given the Noahide laws and imposing them on everyone else besides Israel? You don't. What we find in Torah is one Torah for everyone. Not two Torahs, one Torah. It gets better. Maimonides goes on. Even though we have received all of these commands from Moses, and furthermore, they are concepts which in intellect itself tends to accept, it appears from the Torah's words that Adam was commanded concerning these. Mm, keep that in mind. He says, The prohibition against eating flesh from a living animal was added for Noah, as Genesis 9-4 states, Nevertheless, you may not eat flesh with its life, with its blood. Thus, there are seven mitzvot. These matters remained the same throughout the world until Abraham. When Abraham arose, in addition to these, he was commanded regarding circumcision. Okay, so he's saying there's additional things that are added when Abraham comes along, namely circumcision. But he's referring to the laws for Israel, or what he would call the Jews, not the Noahide laws. Noahide laws do not contain circumcision. That's just for what they consider the special people, okay? But as far as, well, we back up real quick. If you'll notice here, he's making the claim that these Noahide laws were given to Adam, have been existent since Adam, Okay since the very beginning. That's what he's trying to say. But notice something that's not included in the Noahide laws. If it was from the beginning, ever since Adam, why is there nothing about Shabbat? Very, very interesting. As we presented in our drush, in our live stream about Shabbat, Shabbat observance is very, very important to Yahweh. Okay, we see that all throughout Scripture, that we are to keep the Shabbat as a remembrance forever, throughout our generations. So why is that not in the Noahide laws? Why was that not from the beginning of those things that were given to Adam? Very interesting, but we'll get to back to Shabbat here in just a moment. I just wanted to point that out, that you do not find 
anything about Shabbat in the Noahide laws. And Maimonides goes on, you remember the one in the Noahide laws about adultery and fornication? He expands on those and goes on to say that these there are six illicit sexual relations forbidden to a Noahide. His mother, his father's wife, a married woman, his maternal sister, a male, and an animal. Now, a Noahide, what he's referring to here, is someone who is following the Noahide laws. Okay, they're not a Jew. They're a non-Jew who is following the Noahide laws. That's a Noahide. <coughs> but it's very interesting how he clearly states specifically that a man is, all these right here, from what I take, is just referencing men, okay? But he says that a man is not to have illicit sexual relations with his maternal sister, but says nothing about his paternal sister. Very, very odd, okay? Also notice there's a distinction here, too, between a man's father's wife and a man's mother. Pick up on that. Think about that. So we see some things already with regard to the Noahide laws that don't actually, you know, bode well and feel good, right? And there's a lot more gloominess to come about the Noahide laws. We look at the Jewish Encyclopedia. What it states is, with but a few exceptions, the punishment meted out to a Noahid for the transgression of any of the seven laws is decapitation, the least painful of the four modes of execution of criminals. The many formalities of procedure essential when the accused is an Israelite need not be observed in the case of the Noahid. The Noahid may be convicted on the testimony of one witness, even on that of relatives, but not on that of a woman. He need have had no warning from the witnesses, and a single judge may pass sentence on him. Again, totally contradicting Scripture, because Scripture states, especially for capital punishment, that you're not convicted except on the, wit on the um, testimony of two or three witnesses. Okay? And they're saying here that for all non-Jews, it can just be on one witness completely contradicting scripture. Again, the universal Jewish encyclopedia states, the punishment for infraction of most of these laws is death by strangulation. Unlike Jewish law, better translated Torah, a Noahide could be convicted on the testimony of even only one witness and could be sentenced by even only one judge. Similar to Jewish law, however, women were disqualified to act either as witnesses or or as judges. Again, pretty much the same thing we read from the Jewish encyclopedia, except this is a little bit different. It doesn't say decapitation. It just says strangulation. Okay? But not to be outdone, Maimonides adds even more to this. In Mishneh Torah, Kings and Wars, a Noahide is executed for every type of foreign worship which a Jewish court would consider worthy of capital punishment. However, a Noahide is not executed for a type of foreign worship which a Jewish court would not deem worthy of capital punishment. Nevertheless, even though a Noahide will not be executed for these forms of worship, he is forbidden to engage in all of them. A Noahide who curses God's name, whether he uses God's unique name, or one of his other names in any language is liable. This law does not apply with regard to Jews. A Noahide who slays any soul, even a fetus in its mother's womb, should be executed in retribution for its death. So, okay, credit where credit is due. 
for someone who commits an abortion, hey, take care of them. I'm on board with that. But as far as this section goes, this is all I'm on board for. Anyone who uses God's unique name, okay? Those of us who are of the messianic mindset, okay, we're, if this was to be enforced, we would have targets on our backs, right? Especially people like me who put videos out there to the public. So there's that. But that contradicts scripture as well because over almost 7,000 times, Yahweh's name is used and placed in scripture. We see that over and over again. It's so important, his name. And to blot it out with some other name or some other title is its horrible in my way of thinking. Is that we should use Yahweh's name, get it out there to the world, and relate to everyone how magnificent and how wonderful he is. And what he has done for us and what he can do for them. But according to these Noahide laws and the way they're interpreted by people like Maimonides... You can see what's going on here. And notice also the two roads idea as well, that things that apply to the Jews, I'm sorry, things that apply to the Noahides don't apply to the Jews. Again, Maimonides in Mishneh Torah, he is liable for relations with a male, whether a minor or an adult, and with an animal, whether young or old. In the latter instance, the Noahide alone is executed and not the animal. We are only commanded to kill an animal with which a Jew engaged in relations. A Noahide is liable for violating the prohibition against theft, whether he stole from another Gentile or from a Jew. This applies to one who forcefully robs an individual or steals money, a kidnapper, an employer who withholds his workers' wages, and the like. Even a worker who eats from his employer's produce when he is not working. In all such cases, he is liable and is considered as a robber. With regard to Jews, the law is different. Again, double standards. And he goes on. This applies to one who forcefully robs an individual or steals money. A kidnapper, an employer who withholds his workers' wages and the like, even a worker who eats from his employer's produce, when he is not working in all such cases, he is liable and is considered as a robber. With regard to Jews, the law is different. Similarly, a Noahide is liable for stealing an object worth less than a peruta. Thus, if one Noahide stole an object worth less than a peruta and another Noahide stole it from him, they are both executed because of it. Similarly, a Noahide is liable for violating the prohibition against eating a limb or flesh from a living creature. This applies regardless of the amount involved, for the specification of minimum amounts only applies to Jews. A Noahide is permitted blood from a living creature. Furthermore, there are instances where a Noahide would be held liable and a Jew will not. For a Noahide is liable for a limb or flesh from a living creature, whether from a domesticated animal or a beast, whether from a kosher or non-kosher species. Again, double standards. And he goes on. A Noahide who transgresses these seven commands shall be executed by decapitation. A Noahide who is executed on the basis of the testimony of one witness and the verdict of a single judge. No warning is required. Relatives may serve as witnesses. However, a woman may not serve as a witness or a judge for them. We already saw that right previously, right? So that's part of the gloominess of this whole concept of the Noahide laws. But it wasn't just Maimonides in the 12th century. It wasn't just the Talmud creators Back in the 3rd century CE, it even continues up until our day. For example, Chabad.org. By the same regard, Moses was commanded by the Almighty to compel all the inhabitants of the world to accept the commandments given to Noah's descendants. If one does not accept these commands, he should be executed. A person who formally accepts these commands is called a resident alien. 
This applies only when he accepts them and fulfills them, because the Holy One, blessed be he, commanded them in the Torah and informed us through Moses, our teacher, that Noah's descendants had been commanded to fulfill them previously. Again, more and more gloominess surrounding this Noahide law stuff. But again, even modern Orthodox Judaism from Chabad.org states that, you know, there's two different roads and that it was given to Moses, even though it's nowhere in Scripture. From the Jewish Encyclopedia, if he slay a man in self-defense, the Noahid is guilty of murder and must pay the death penalty, although under the same circumstances, an Israelite would not be executed. Again, double standard, even though we see that there's only one Torah for everyone. And you'll see here that it's stating that the Noahid, the person who is following the Noahid laws, cannot defend themselves. Because if they do, and they end up killing the person who is attacking them, well, then they're going to die because they killed someone in self-defense. I mean, it's like a catch-22 here. The Jewish Encyclopedia again. Hence, the Talmud prohibited the teaching to a Gentile of the Torah, the inheritance of congregation of Jacob. Our Yohanan says of one so teaching, such a person deserves death, an idiom used to express indignation. It is like placing an obstacle before the blind. And yet, if a Gentile study the, study the law for the purpose of observing the moral laws of Noah, R. Meyer says he is as good as a high priest and quotes, You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. Hmm. Well, as we know from Scripture, one Torah, all of Torah, is for everyone. Okay? So, in contradiction to Orthodox rabbinic, rabbinicalism, we can study Torah. We can be taught Torah. Because there's nothing in Scripture prohibiting it. We don't follow Orthodox rabbis, we follow Yeshua and the word of Yahweh. But it gets even deeper. More into the weeds here. The Jewish Encyclopedia again. Resh Lakish said, A Gentile observing the Sabbath deserves death. This refers to a Gentile who accepted the seven laws of the Noah Noahidae, inasmuch as the Sabbath is a sign between God and Israel alone, and it was probably directed against the Christian Jews who disregarded the Mosaic laws and yet at that time kept up the observance of the Jewish Sabbath. This is interesting on more than one level. Okay, Number one, it states here that any Gentile, i.e. non-Jew, what they're saying here, any Gentile who observes the Sabbath should die. Okay, totally contradicting scripture. They're adding to scripture again here. So, in addition to that, it's also, you know, they're referring to the people who are the Noahides, right? The people who are trying to do this whole Noahide law. And they say that the Sabbath is a sign between God and Israel. Well, we know from Scripture that there was more than just Israel there at Mount Sinai. It was both Israelites and non-Israelites. So way more than the tribe of Judah. Okay? And Sabbath was part of the Torah. And Sabbath is very important and stated so over and over again. Now, when someone comes into Israel, they are grafted in and they become part of Israel. So it's all one. So you can say that the Sabbath is for Israel. I would say that it's you know for everyone since the beginning. But if you want to say it's just for Israel, 
You know, we can agree with that, but Israel includes more than just the Jews, the tribe of Judah. It includes more than just the Jews, the Judeans of the southern kingdom. It includes all those native-born and those who have been grafted in. That's all of Israel. And that is who should be keeping Shabbat especially, but everyone in the world should be keeping Shabbat. So, let's move on and learn about some modern claims about the Noahide laws, because this is going to be very, very important if you've made it to this point so far. Definitely stay tuned for this next part. So like I said, the doom and gloom and some of the bad things that we've observed so far from the Noahide laws and this whole concept of it is more than just from the 200s when they created the Talmud, more than just from the 12th century and Maimonides also comes up to today's time. But let's look at the um, another section from Chabad.org. Moses only gave the Torah and mitzvot as an inheritance to Israel. As Deuteronomy 33.4 states, the Torah is the inheritance of the congregation of Jacob. And to all those who desire to convert from among the nations, as Numbers 15.15 states, the convert shall be the same as you. However, someone who does not desire to accept Torah and mitzvot should not be forced to. By the same regard, Moses was commanded by the Almighty to compel all the inhabitants of the world to accept the commandments given to Noah's descendants. Anyone who accepts upon himself the fulfillment of these seven mitzvot and is precise in their observance is considered one of the pious among the Gentiles and will merit a share in the world to come. This is modern times. This is not 12th century or even before. This is in our day and age this kind of thing is still going on, even though you find it nowhere in Scripture, nowhere in the Tanakh, nowhere in the Torah. It just all comes directly from the Talmud, which is a rabbinic creation that is not divinely inspired and has zero authority on a true believer. But again, they're making this statement that the Torah, and we saw Shabbat earlier, but here they're saying the Torah is the inheritance of the congregation of Jacob, that the Torah is the inheritance of Israel. Galatians 3, 26 through 29. For you are all sons of Elohim through belief in Messiah Yeshua. For as many of you as were immersed into Messiah have put on Messiah, there is not Yehudi nor Greek. There is not slave nor free. There is not male and female, for you are all one in Messiah Yeshua. And if you are of Messiah, then you are a seed of Abraham and heirs according to promise. So if you have been saved, if you have come to Yeshua, our Messiah, if you have been born again, you are Israel. You are part of the righteous ones. You are the Zidakim. Nothing else needed. No additional Noahide laws, because there is one Torah. We are all Israel once we become saved. But, it's not just Orthodox Judaism or the Orthodox rabbis that state this kind of thing too. On the flip side of the coin, there are, how should I say it, non-Jews who are trying to say stuff about the Noahide laws as well. They're not promoting them. Take a look at this next section. This is from a website. I've listed it there for you on the screen, but this is not to pick on this one author on this one website. This is actually the mindset and what's being put out there sometimes. Okay. And the art, the author writes in this article, how did the Noah law, Noahide laws become law in America? Okay. And then he references 
House Joint Resolution 104 from way back in 1991, 30 years ago. And then after that, he references or he says, notice how the bill lets the cat out of the bag as to why they want guillotines. And then he references not a federal joint resolution. He references a bill from the state of Georgia. Now, for those of you who don't know, Georgia is only one of the 57 states, as Obama would put it. Right? Georgia is only one state in the 50 United States. Very, very interesting. The first House joint resolution from the, you know, United States uh, House of Representatives is only about a, a page and a quarter long. It's in the notes that I've provided for you on this subject. And you go look at it for yourself. It's a quick read. And it's not as scary as this author makes out. Okay, we're going to read that in just a moment. But then after he quotes that from the House, or from the United States House, he then goes down to Georgia for a bill about guillotines. And he wants you to make the connection that the Noahide laws and guillotines are connected and to be scared. Now, something to keep in mind, first off, is the difference between a bill and a resolution. Okay. From the guide to legislative votes, there are two main types of legislation that originate from each house of Congress, bills and resolutions. Bills, if passed by the house and Senate and signed by the president become binding law and part of the United States code. Resolutions are not laws. Rather, they are expressions of the sentiments of either the house or Senate. Again, from encyclopedia.com. Although easily confused, resolutions are not laws, but rather the statements of intent or declarations that affect the operations of Congress. Resolutions, which are not legislative in character, are used primarily to express principles, facts, opinions, and the purposes of both the House and the Senate, that is, until they pass both houses. When Congress seeks to pass a law, however, it uses either a bill or a joint resolution which must be passed by both houses in identical form and then presented to the president for approval or disapproval. So there's the difference between a bill that goes through Congress and a resolution. Now, what this author from this website is referencing is a resolution from the House that was back in 1991. Let's look at that real quick. Again, you can look this up yourself. It is Public Law 102-14 from the 102nd Congress back in 1991. Again, you can look that up yourself. You can top in the link down below, or you can just click on the link from the notes because it is in the notes that we provided for you. But this resolution states, as what I have on screen, Whereas these ethical values and principles have been the bedrock of society from the dawn of civilization, when they were known as the seven Noahide laws, whereas Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson, leader of the Lubavitch movement, is universally respected and revered, and his 89th birthday falls on March 26, 1991. Now therefore, be it resolved by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America that March 26, 1991, is designated as Education Day USA. Okay, there's there's nothing in there about some grand Jewish conspiracy. Okay? They're recognizing this rabbi for all he's done, and they're incorrectly you know, stating that seven Noahide laws were from the dawn of civilization, but that was probably influenced by this Lubavitch movement and their lobbyists but whatever. Anyway, this whole resolution thing is not creating a law. It's not forcing people to do the Noahide laws or be executed. No, what this resolution is doing is saying that March 26th is Education Day, an, another national holiday, if you, if you will, right? Nothing about forcing Noahide laws on everyone.
So, like I said, the author in that website stated this as, you know, be scared because they're going to force it on you and make you do it. It's law now in the United States. Okay, we just saw that, no, this is not law. This is not forcing anyone to obey the Noahide laws. And then he goes on to speak about a bill from the state of Georgia regarding guillotines. And that is from the Georgia House of Representatives 1995-96 sessions, House Bill 1274, death penalty guillotine provisions. Okay. And it states, policy to provide for death by guillotine to provide for... The General Assembly finds that while prisoners condemned to death may wish to donate one or more of their organs for transplant, the intent of the General Assembly in enacting this legislation is to provide for a method of execution which is compatible with the donation of organs by a condemned prisoner. Okay. So the author is expecting you to put these two things together. Number one, to assume that the first resolution we read was making the Noahide laws national law across America, and it wasn't. Then he's supposed he's expecting you to assume that this whole guillotine thing from the state of Georgia is connected with that, and that you're going to be guillotined for not following the Noahide laws. And this bill from Georgia has absolutely nothing to do with the Noahide laws, even though he includes it in his article. He includes the full text, right? It has nothing to do with Noahide laws. It has to do with condemned prisoners who are on death row. They're going to be executed for, you know, whatever crime they were convicted of. And they want to donate their organs after they're dead. Well, if they were electrocuted, that would render organs, you know, unusable. If they were injected with, you know, what do they call it? Whatever lethal drug they use, that would render the organs, you know, unusable. But death by guillotine, you know, that would still allow you to donate your organs to someone who may need them. So again, this has nothing to do with Noahide laws. Not even the national resolution about the education day. It has nothing to do with that. So one thing to note here too is that even though this author posted the full text of this on his website in that article, I could not independently find this bill from the Georgia Assembly. Okay, It was kind of hard to find anything before 2001 from Georgia. So I don't even know if this is... I haven't confirmed it, put it that way. But... He included it in there, and it's even though he included it in his article, it still did not help his case. Okay? So there's no grand Jewish conspiracy to force everyone to obey the Noahide laws. And it makes no sense to think that there would be anyways. Because when you look at Israel, they're not even enforcing it over there. You've got pride parades that go on in Israel. That doesn't sound like enforcement of the Noahide laws. You've even got that big zit on the Temple Mount, right? Doesn't seem like they're enforcing Noahide laws, even where the Jews have control of an entire country in Israel. They're not enforcing it. So why would you think that there's, they're going to enforce it over here? They're not. This is just a conspiracy theory. There are so many bad things that are happening in America right now that we don't need to come up with new things to be worried about, right? We've got abortion still taking place in America legally. Now we're making progress on that in the past few years, but there's still a long ways to go. We have homosexuality. Marriage is a thing now by law, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But Noahide laws are not a law in America. I mean, think about it. If, they passed the Noahide laws into federal law. That's all you would hear about for like a year solid on the nightly news. 
It would be that huge. I mean, secularists complain about the Ten Commandments being displayed at restaurants and at courthouses. They complain about Christmas trees being displayed, even though, you know, I don't agree with Christmas, but still, secularists complain about Christmas trees being displayed on public places. And that, in spite of the fact that they are not even being pressured to abide by Christianity or to celebrate Christmas, no one's trying to force them to do that. But they're still raising Cain about it, right? So if they actually did pass the Noahide laws into American federal law, you would definitely know about it. You wouldn't need some backwater website on the website to on the internet to get this out to you. Okay, so that's all just a conspiracy theory. There is no grand Jewish conspiracy to force the Noahide laws on everyone. Now, you may be asking, okay, well, hold on a minute. In a previous video, you stated that you thought there was good evidence for Torah before Sinai. Okay, fair point. And you're right. I did, and I still do believe that. Okay, but it's not the same thing as the Noahide laws. Okay, Shabbat, eating clean, no adultery, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, I still believe was before Sinai, but it was for everyone, not just the non Israelites. It was for everyone because it was from creation for all of humanity. And there's a stark difference between that and the Noahide laws creating two different laws for two different peoples. Okay? Torah, as I'll always say, because it's the scripture, that there is one Torah for everyone, both the Israelite and the non Israelite. That's scripture. So if you've made it this far, Thank you so much. This is going on whew, about an hour and a half now on this drush. So thank you for making this so far. Let's go ahead and wrap this up. In summary, we see that the Noahide laws are simply just a fanciful invention of rabbinic Judaism created back from the Talmud. They don't come from scripture. And there is no grand conspiracy of Judaism to enforce the Noahide laws on the whole world, creating a one world religion and behead the breakers of the Noahide laws. Okay, that's not happening. It's not a thing. We would definitely know about it because Islam, they're beheading people. We know about that. We know about their enforcement of Sharia in the countries they control. We know they're killing homosexuals and throwing them off buildings. You can see the videos, if you really wanted to, of them beheading people, okay? That's Islam. Judaism, on the other hand, they're not going around and beheading people, okay? There is no grand Jewish conspiracy to force the Noahide laws on everyone. Now, there is only one Torah, not two, and there is only one way to salvation, and to the kingdom of Yahweh, not to. And that's just the God honest truth. We'd like to thank you tonight for joining us for tonight's live stream and for tonight's drush. If you made it this far, awesome. Good job. Way to go. Hopefully you got a big list of notes there. And if you happen to miss anything or like to see extra stuff, go check us out. Uh, on GodHonestTruth.com, and you'll also be able to see those notes for the Noahide laws that we took during our research as well. In just a moment, we'll be doing the Aaronic benediction. And while we're doing that, if there's anyone there with you at home that you would like to have gathered near to you, go ahead and start gathering them together. And while you're doing that, also make sure to go down below, leave us a comment, just shalom, hi, or what have you something you may have learned from tonight's live stream or just a comment on the production quality even. 
the video quality, sound quality, etc. We just love hearing from you guys. And while you're down there, make sure to hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, ring the bell, and also hit that share button and share it around with someone you know. All right, and now for our Aaronic Benediction. Yivarikaka Yahweh, Vayishmarecha, Yair Yahweh Penave Lecha, Vihunecha, Yisaha Yahweh Penave Lecha, Vayasim Lecha, Shalom. May Yahweh bless you and guard you. May Yahweh make his face shed light upon you and be gracious unto you. May Yahweh lift up his face unto you and give you peace. Thank you again for joining us tonight. We hope that you got something out of tonight's live stream and tonight's teaching. We hope you have a wonderful and restful Shabbat. And we hope that your next upcoming week is filled with good food, good friends, good family, good spirits, good health, good food. And until we meet again, take care of yourself, take care of each other. Shabbat Shalom and Shavua Tov. See you.